Hey, welcome everybody to video number 12. This is part 3 on the vehicle AI. And today we will be implementing the uh, early avoidance system. And I say early because uh, you're going to have a functional system at the end of this video, but it's going to be kind of kind of rough, you know. And we're going to have a lot of work to do in part 4 to uh, refine it further. And uh, in order to demonstrate avoidance we will have to have two cars on the map and it would help a lot if one of them was faster than the other and so let's create another car if I go into my tutorial folder okay uh, do, 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 do. let's create a new blueprint For the uh, parent class, we are going to choose BP Porsche 911 tutorial in my case, which is basically just your uh, first vehicle you've made, which is going to become your master class. And uh, yeah, every other vehicle in the game is going to be a child of that blueprint. Let's call it. I suppose we could call it BP Porsche Tutorial 02. <laughs> this is going to get real confusing real fast. Uh, yeah, basically, so every inputs, every camera system, everything you did in your first car is going to be also done for every child blueprint that you make of it. And so, yeah, basically you won't have to redo everything every time you add a new car. So let's open our car number two. And just so we can tell them apart from each other, we are going to change the color of this one. Let's find the paint material. That would be this one. Uh, how about flat color red there Yeah, you look good. Okay, those are probably for the calipers Let's Change them too Okay, everything is red now good <laughs> Let's add it to the map real quick make sure we're also possessing that one with the AI so here in the pawn section sorry about that auto possess AI is going to be placed in world or spawned and the AI controller class is going to be uh, that was be BP AI tutorial now if we just test it again if you click that triple dot here and choose simulate you can see both of the cars are being controlled by the AI, which is perfect. But you can also see the red one is kind of trying to push the blue one, and it's driving right behind it. And now it kind of passed it, if we can just play that again. I suppose being so close to it, when they were taking that curve, the red one just probably pushed onto the blue one. And so the, the blue one lost control and got out of the way, basically. Uh, which is not an avoidance system by any means. <laughs> Let's have a close look at them. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. The red one is pushing the blue one out of the way. And you can see there, the blue one, while attempting to get back onto the track, uh, does a pit maneuver on the, the red one which is to just hit their corner to cause them to drift out of the way and all of that is perfectly unintentional and also unacceptable for an AI and so that's what we're gonna fix today in this video and so okay we have our two cars I suppose we could make one of them faster as well to further demonstrate the avoidance system uh, the way you can make them faster would be to go into your vehicle setup engine let's increase the torque 
and so the gear ratios is the same and so your top speed is going to be the same but the torque is dictating how fast something can accelerate basically so let's set that to 900 and so the red one is going to accelerate a whole lot faster than the blue one let's see how that works here yeah you can see the red one is drifting a lot more than the blue one and immediately catches up to it All right, and that amount of drifting also is a problem. Uh, what we should do is enable traction control in these cars so that uh, they don't drift, basically. We'll do that as well in the further video. <laughs> for now, I think 900 is going to be too much for the demonstration because of all the drifting. Let's go ahead and set that to 750 and call it good enough. Then we can start working on the avoidance. Let's open up our BP AI tutorial controller right here first thing we're gonna do today is open up that macro we made in the last video now if you recall that macro is used to set the angle of the destination location and also the location itself so we can you know calculate the distance and whatnot what we're gonna do here we are getting the distance along spline we're also going to get the right vector at that same location let's add a reroute node here by double clicking the line let's drag off of it and uh, get right vector at distance along spline that would be that the distance would be the same as the first one so that would be that coordinate system we're going to need we're going to leave to local and not world because this is going to be an offset from the spline itself and so we're not going to use world coordinates for that let us move all of that to the right a little bit something like this again being careful not to make too much of a mess so you're able to come back to it and read through and understand what's happening okay now that we have the right vector we are going to want to multiply that by a float that float is going to be an offset that we're going to set in a function a separate function that is going to be the uh, avoidance calculations and that offset is going to get added here to that first yeah, to that first location so we're going to have a little plus create an add node then we are going to add this multiplied version here and feed that here into our angle calculation Uh, and that here is going to be a float variable which is uh, how much offset from the track and so we're going to convert pin to a float double precision and just drag off of it and create promote to variable we're going to call that avoidance offset okay now we can set this variable here to anything we want and test it right away to make sure that little calculation we just added uh, is working properly. So let's set that here to 800 just so we get a nice obvious value. And I'm so glad I did that because it does not work. <laughs> That's why it's important to test often along the way.
Oh, actually, no, it does probably work. Except we're just, we're debugging the location and not the location that's used to calculate the angle. You know what, let's, uh... Huh. That's interesting. Alright, let's make a third one. Just for laughs and giggle. <laughs> because that's not complicated enough already. We'll make that one blue. For no reason. And we'll add a third output, which is going to be location with avoidance. Okay, that's going to be a vector as well. And that is going to be the location we use to calculate the angle here, which is just a regular location of where we're looking at plus the right vector multiplied by an offset and that's basically going to be you know an offset onto the right vector vector which is going to be perpendicular to the spline or 90 degrees from it if you prefer and now we can visualize both of these so location with avoidance is going to be blue and we'll be able to see that the blue circle is going to be at the same distance as the green one, but offset 8 meters to the right of the spline. There you go. Now you can see blue here isn't really visible, but you can see the AI are offset from the spline, just like so, and everything works. Now we just need to set that value at runtime to, to use that to offset the steering for each car to avoid each other's. And that's the, uh, that's the hard part. Let's actually change the blue because I can't see blue apparently on black. Uh, let's go ahead and make that, let's call it yellow. Yellow-ish. Alright. Let's get to work now on the avoidance. <clears throat> we'll make a new function. Because otherwise this is going to be a mess. So let's go ahead let's go ahead here in the uh, left section. Hit that little plus and call that avoidance calculation. And before we start doing anything here, let's go back to the event graph. Nope. Add our new function onto the execution path, which is that white line right after the event tech before we set the steering. Because too often I'm going to do a bunch of stuff inside of a function and completely forget to add it to the graph later on. And so I don't know why nothing is happening and I'm just never executing my function because when you create one it automatically opens it and then you, you just do stuff in there and it never gets executed <laughs> okay oh boy where do I start now I'll give you a preview of uh, the final version here's what that's gonna look like <laughs> I have to break this up in sections so that you can understand what I'm doing and why <laughs> Wish me luck. So the very first thing we need to do is to detect other vehicles around the vehicle that the AI is driving. And the, the best way, or the most effective way I found of doing this, because there's a million different ways you can do this, but the one we're going to use is to create a capsule trace for objects. Capsule trace for objects. You have a few options you can set right away, namely the uh, radius, 
we'll set that to 500 because uh, with the dimension of the cars that's what makes the most sense for uh, for me for what I find out through trial and error let's uh, ignore self by default let's leave that on that's good actors to ignore let's make an array all right make array 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 however you say that and the the only element in that array is going to be the car that the AI is controlling because you don't want to uh, you don't want to have that trace here detect the car that the AI is driving obviously because you're not trying to avoid your own car so from the previous tutorials we made this variable here controlled car that's what we're going to use here to prevent the AI from avoiding itself now object types here lets you define exactly what types of objects you want that trace to detect it, it seems pretty straightforward but so again we'll make an array and here we only want to be detecting vehicles now the way that this works let me go ahead and open the vehicle blueprint because it's quite it's kind of a big deal what I just showed you here it's important to know why that works now when something has a collision on it let's go back to the uh, collision here you can set collision preset now this one is set to vehicle by default because we're expanding or more like the car blueprint is a child of wheeled vehicle which is set to by default have its mesh component use the vehicle collision preset but you have a lot of different presets you can use uh, characters are going to be set to default to use the pawn preset and so that's where you're going to uh, choose that preset here and that's how you can dif differentiate an actor from another using the collision presets basically which is what we're doing here to only detect vehicles with that trace so we don't detect like the ground for example because that would happen if we didn't have that little check here okay now that line trace we need to decide where it starts and where it ends and to do that we're again going to use the controlled cart variable we are going to get actor location on that get actor location and that's going to be the start position and then for the end position we are going to add an offset plug that into the end that offset is going to be control card forward vector get actor forward vector this is way too close this is making quite a clutter so the offset is going to be the forward vector multiplied by an offset value which is going to be a float and if you've noticed the way you do a line trace is actually a lot similar to the way we've added our avoidance offset into our little graph here in that little macro So again, you need to convert that pin here to a float double precision. And you can use anything here from a map range to a fixed float or whatever. I like to have the distance at which I'm checking for cause to grow longer the faster I go. Because the faster the car is going, the slower it's going to speed to uh, avoid losing control and so the further away it should be looking for obstacles if that makes any sense and so here that float is going to be a map range now that map range here we can use the target speed let me see here into the event graph
set throttle input. This is a bit of a mess. I haven't opened that blueprint in a little bit now, so I'm starting to forget what it was like. And I do not set a variable to how fast the car is going that I can use elsewhere in the blueprint. So let's actually go ahead and do that. Just so we don't have to repeat these three nodes everywhere, we need the speed. We'll just drag off here of that get forward speed mile per hour. Drag off of it and make it a variable. And that would be our actual speed. Let's plug that in here. And now we can use the actual speed everywhere we need to. We, we can actually leave that one here. It wouldn't make sense to uh, mess with it. Now, yeah, you, you can use that speed everywhere in the graph without re-executing those three nodes for no reason. And that's why I like to set variables for everything. It's just one way to optimize your code. So let's uh, grab the actual speed here and let's say put it here because I like to group my variables together like that so all the speed is in one place and all the distance is in another place. And now with that we can use the actual speed here in the avoidance. The actual speed is going to be the input that we use. Let's say zero if you're at a full stop and 110 mile per hour should be fast enough if not you can feel free to come back here and increase that and uh, how far I should be looking would be the uh, here back to the event graph we're using steer prediction distance so that would be our minimum I'm assuming so, 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 min, where are you? Throttle prediction distance, steer prediction distance. All right, sorry about that. That should be your minimum. And how about for the maximum, we get the prediction distance, multiply it by something like 1.5. Okay. And now that's that. So now that's going to return if you break that here, break the hit result, hit that arrow to expand it and see everything in there. That is going to give you what actor that capsule is hitting first. And then you can get the location and a bunch of other things off of that result. The very first thing we want to do, return value here is going to be true if the trace hits something and it's going to be false if it doesn't hit anything. So we'll drag off of that and create a branch. And if that branch here is false, meaning we haven't collided with any vehicles, then our avoidance offset should be nothing or zero. Because we, we haven't got anything to avoid, right? And if it is true, then we need to set that avoidance to something a lot more complicated than zero. <laughs> uh, oh boy, the fun begins. Okay, let's completely ignore that section right now and go step by step while testing every step along the way. Okay, so let's get the controlled car. Let us get the transform of that. So get actor transform. I would usually just get the location but what's fun with transform is you can break it here to use the location in one place and use the actual transform in another. 
uh, which is going to be a big deal here because we are going to find relative look at rotation right and the uh, start transform is going to be that of our controlled car and so by doing that we can still get the location for another another place in the graph if we need and the target location of that here is going to be let's uh, use the hit actor and again get actor location because I'm not going to need anything else than the location okay uh, some would argue you could just use the uh, the location vector here that is if you read that location of the hit in world space I uh, having issues with a lot of these they, they're not really consistent and whatnot but one would argue that getting the hit location rather than the actor location might be more accurate in terms of the uh, avoidance but uh, you know cars are big we don't need accuracy so let's roll with that let's grab the uh, rotator output and split it because we only need to use the yaw which is the Z rotation and for the next part we are using the absolute which is the positive of that output so basically here if the yaw is minus 90 the absolute output is going to be 90 okay so we're getting the uh, the amplitude without the sign which is the number without the negative or positive and that is important here because we're going to use yet again another map range and uh, then we're going to get the result of that and multiply it by the sign here and I know this makes no sense right now because we just use that node here to get a value that's always going to be positive and here we'll multiply that by the sign to make it again either positive or negative so we, we just did all that for nothing uh, except not because that map range here is linear it's not a curve although it should be it will be in a future video uh, but for now it's a map range it's a linear and it's a lot easier to work with them if you only have positive values so let's say here 0 0.01 because just 0 would be a mess to 90 degrees and we're gonna get an offset of minus 500 to let's go with minus 250 and now you might be wondering why those specific values I'll explain in a second now the result of that is what we're going to use to set the avoidance offset okay all right so let's here explain what that's doing let's pretend your car is right here the car in front of you is right here you're getting a yaw of about 20 or in this case minus 20 okay so you're getting the absolute of that which is 20 feeding that into the, the map range here from 0 to 90 that gives you the exact offset you need and then you are going to multiply that by the sign so that you know whether that is left or right okay and that's that basically so let's go ahead and try that right away just to make sure we didn't mess anything up And now you can see the red one is avoiding the blue one and vice versa and they're not hitting each other anymore you can see here from the camera view at the bottom right 
they're not coming close to each other anymore and you can see here that the blue one the yellow which is the uh, location with offset is actually onto the right of the red car while the red one is right in front of it because it's got nothing to avoid and you see past a certain distance that car isn't considered for avoidance anymore and so the blue car just doesn't have an offset anymore all right so that is basically working right now as it is although uh, in a real world scenario we're gonna need a little more complexity than that because not every map is a simple oval okay also the reason we need to uh, complicate this a little bit is because right now it's easy to avoid the car in front of you because they're all roughly going the same speed oh. now let's pretend here you're on the starting line you're behind a car and your car is twice as fast you're going to accelerate really fast and uh, the speed difference between your car and the one in front of you is going to be huge and the, the distance you have in between those two cars the distance you have to be able to steer is really short so those uh, those are two factors we need to account for in our avoidance is how far apart we are and what's the difference in speed and so how fast am I closing in on whatever car is in front of me which will cause you to steer a lot faster to avoid a collision let's reopen our AI controller now that we know that this much is working and we're gonna add to it quite a few things so the first bit here would be the distance yeah let's go with the distance first <laughs> so we're gonna multiply that by yet another offset that offset again is going to be a map range clamp the uh, value of that would be uh, the distance in between the two cars and so we're gonna get actor location here which is the, the car we're detecting we're gonna get a distance vector and we're gonna get the distance between that and our own controlled car by breaking the transform and getting the location out of it like so now if you if you like clean graphs you can just get the control car again and uh, you know get actor location right here but since we're already getting the transform here let's avoid useless operations and just reuse the same the same variable here and just split it again for performance reason okay and so that distance here is fed into a map range again variables here that I've tweaked extensively to get right first one here would be again our steer prediction distance for a minimum and let's say the maximum should be twice that so multiply that by 2 plug that into the range B and let's say let's say if we are super far which would be twice as far as the steer prediction distance and more uh, then that steering avoidance is perfect and we're just gonna multiply it by one which isn't gonna change anything although if we are closer than that we are going to multiply it by a lot let's go ahead and multiply it by three and give that a try and see what that does and so if all is going well 
the closer you are to the car you're trying to avoid, the more offset you're adding to the steering and therefore the, the more aggressive the steering is going to be for you to avoid collision. Okay, let's again give that a try by putting them really close to each other like that. And you can see here that the steering is really aggressive, right? You can see that the yellow triangle is way off, like to the point where it's way too much. Let's go ahead and tweak that. I think three might be uh, a little excessive. Let's go ahead and reduce that in half for both of them. Uh, no, not 5.5. 5. <laughs> okay. And again, this is really crude. This is a kind of part one of the avoidance. Because, uh, like I said, map range are linear. And you really should be using curves for that. To get, like, the most control for your uh, AI behavior. But, you know, for the sake of uh, sanity and not making two hour long videos, we'll be using map range for now and kind of improve up, improve upon them later on. Again, see what that gives us. You can see the avoidance here is a lot more reasonable. Although still a little much, I think. So let's go back here, and how about one? There, should be good enough. So that's uh, that's for the distance between the car. Let's comment that here. Distance offset. That would be your uh, base offset. And then we need a speed offset, which is just going to be another multiplier here with yet again another map range. Feed that back here into our set avoidance offset. Eh, whatever. Now for the value here, we need the difference in speed from the two cars. And the way we're going to do that is to, 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 to here, hit actor, get velocity. We're not going to cast this to a vehicle blueprint to get its forward speed or whatever fancy, because we, we don't need that much accuracy or anything. We just need to know how fast it's moving roughly even doesn't have to be that accurate and we're going to do the same thing here get velocity for the controlled car I'll just copy and paste it I guess there you go now we're going to need the uh, length of these again copy and paste it And so the length here is always going to be a positive value because uh, it doesn't matter the direction it's going. It's always uh, the vector length is basically the amplitude of that velocity vector, which is uh, the amount and not the direction. And so the amount is always going to be positive, even if a negative direction. Okay. And so we're just going to negate or subtract those two in order to get the difference and now since we don't know which one is bigger than which we don't want to end up with a negative value here for the distance so we're going to feed it into an absolute node again just again so so we know we got a nice positive value here for the map range so that we don't get any uh, funny behavior because we're we're using the map range clamped here so if we set it let's say let's say again same here steer prediction distance 
and steer prediction distance multiplied by two. Now your steer steer prediction is I think it's set to a thousand. Yeah. And so anything from zero to a thousand is going to give you the outrange one. And so if you feed it a negative value here, you're gonna get in trouble because a negative value is smaller than zero. And so if that one here is going, let's say, uh, 500 miles an hour, that one here is going 100, then you get a value of 400, and everything is working fine with that map range. And let's say the opposite, that one is going 100 miles an hour, and that one 500, then 1 minus 5 is minus 4, and all of a sudden, you're below zero, and you're always returning that one, which is wrong. So we're getting an absolute variable and so again let's uh, really scientifically choose variables for these two outputs here and go ahead with one or yeah one and if you're really far away you're not gonna steer as much uh, actually Sorry, this isn't the distance, this is the uh, difference in speed. Okay, so the greater the difference in speed, the more we are going to exaggerate the avoidance. I should actually probably leave that to 1 and reduce that 1 to, let's say, 0.2. Again, you're going to have to play around a lot with these two variables and these two and these two <laughs> to, to get the right variables for you for the, the handling of your car, which is also going to be an issue in the future because not all of your cars are going to handle the same way because some of them are heavier. Uh, center of mass could be different. So a car that's really forward heavy, it's going to have a lot of grip to be able to steer really, really fast without the tire slipping. Uh, while a car with a center of mass more toward the back would have more traction to the rear wheels and have a, low, a whole lot less of traction in the front for steering. Also, cars are going to be different sizes and whatnot. So every single car in your game is going to handle differently and we're going to need to uh, figure out a way to tell the AI how it should be driving each individual car. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use all of these and make variables out of them and then go into our vehicle blueprint and make variables in the vehicle blueprint that we're going to use to set the variables within the AI and so we, we get different numbers for every car and so you can fine-tune those numbers one by one for every single vehicle so that your AI can drive every different vehicle the best and that's gonna be a long and tedious process I'm sorry you're just gonna have to do it because I don't know any better way of doing it but for now, we're only driving one car, and so we're just kind of hard coding those and tweaking them by hand like that. And so with that, you can tell here, because the difference in speed is very minimal, the AI does not need to steer a lot to avoid it. Really, really not a whole lot. As you can see here, they are driving, oops, right side to side. So that's maybe a little too little. Let's uh, improve that. Now there's two ways you can improve that. One of which would be to uh, make that multiplier a little bigger. Let's say 0.3. The other one would be here, when they're side by side, when we, you, you get a yaw of 90, you can increase that here to minus 300, for example, instead of 250. And so the, uh, the offset 
is going to be bigger when the angle is 90 degrees. But it's going to remain the same when the angle is zero or when the other car is in front of you. And so, yeah, there's a lot of tweaking involved with all of these variables being in relation to each other. It's, it's quite a complex thing to tweak. And that's why I'm uh, just giving you the, the variables I'm using to spare you the trouble. So if we try that again, you can see here the red car is going to avoid the blue one without touching it, hopefully. There you go. Yeah, it's kind of rubbing some paint off still, but that's really not because of the avoidance speed anymore. I think it's just a matter of uh, getting that a horizontal offset here a little bigger. Minus 275 should be plenty enough. Also, let me show you why I want to use curves instead of map ranges basically everywhere in the graph in the future. And for that, I'll open a curve for you. I'll create one. So right click, blueprint. Uh, can I actually remember? Here, miscellaneous curve. That would be a curve float. Select that, name it, whatever you want. Don't actually create this. I'm just creating it to show you what I mean. Okay, so a map range is a linear. Okay, yeah. Uh, all right. Sorry, I'm dealing with so many monitors. <laughs> it's hard to keep everything visible for you guys on one monitor. So your map range here is going from, let's call it 0 to 90. So we need two keys here. One is going to be 0, 0. The other one is going to be 90, 0. Control A to select all. Can I just right click and fit? Yep, right click and fit. So both of the keys you just added are within view. And so your map range here, you're at zero, you're minus 500. Zero, minus 500. And at 90, you're minus 275, right? So again, control A to select all, right click and fit. And you can see this is a straight line, right? Now, what if, so you add a key here, what if your cars are square and you want the avoidance to look more like this, right? Well, you need a curve for that. Also, we're going to add a second map range to kind of fake this for now, because at zero minus 500, at 90, or when the car is right next to you, you got basically how wide the car is for an offset. And at 180, so add a key, at an angle of 180, which means the car is behind you, you don't want to be avoiding at all, right? So again, There you go. And that's going to be different <clears throat> uh, for many reasons. Like I'm saying here, if your car is a rectangle, you're going to want a curve that looks a little more something like this. And we can make that with map ranges. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So in the future video, that's what we're going to do here. But for now, let's just have another map range. <laughs> let's make some room here. <clears throat> okay. And if uh, here we're going from 0 to 90, 
Now we need to know if we're above 90, we're going to use a different map range. Oops. So greater is an operator here, <coughs> which is basically going to return true if the first input is bigger than the second. And so here, if our angle is bigger than 90, this is going to be true. And so let's go ahead and uh, grab a select, select. Now I like to use that one. I'll show you the other one you can use. So here you have one in the utilities, which is the one I like to use. And you have one in the math operators here. And why I don't like that one as much is because when you put you know, a bool in it, pick A when it's true and B when it's not, it's kind of confusing. And so select here, when you uh, change the index type here to a boolean, it returns true or false instead, which is, uh, you know, easier, I guess, to understand. And so when bigger than 90 is true, we're going to use a different map range and get a different output. And so we're going to get the output of that select here into our multiplier. Let's have a, a second map range. Let's feed that new map range into the true. Let's use the same angle absolute here. And that one is going to go from, uh, from, from, from 90 to 160, let's say. And so at 90, again, minus 275. And at 160, let's call it, uh, I don't know, how about 50? Or, yeah, 50. Minus 50. And why those are negative is because if the car in front of you is 90 degrees to your right, then you want to avoid 275 centimeters to the left. And so you need the output to be opposite from the input. And so that's why all of those are negative. And that's actually going to create kind of a diamond shape around the car. If I can just use here three reroute node to demonstrate that. Okay, so let's say here, this is the front of the car, right? This is the side. And this is the rear. And this is basically what we've created here with the map range. Except, you know, we're avoiding, we're never actually avoiding zero in the front. And so we've made something like this right now, where this is the front of the car, this is the side, and this is behind. And uh, yeah, hopefully I didn't confuse you too bad with that. It'll make more sense in the next video when we uh, remove all of those horrible map range and replace them with curves. <laughs> and now... Uh, now, whenever the car is starting to get in front of the other one, let's go into the top view here. Try to explain that in a different way, hopefully to uh, be able to get some uh, some sense out of this. So here, when we're perfectly behind, the output, the, the offset, sorry, would be 5 meters, right? As we move forward, and the angle between these two is getting closer to 90 degrees, we are reducing that offset all the way down to 275 centimeters. Okay? As we keep moving forward, making that angle closer to 160, we reduce that all the way up to 50. 
and then when we move far enough that the capsule doesn't hit it anymore we reset that offset to zero and voila we just successfully avoided collision with the other car using map ranges <laughs> which is quite of a hack like that that is not what you should do but it works and if you don't want to lose your sanity entirely we're gonna stick with that for now and uh, improve it later on actually the, this whole AI thing is a bit of a hack let me uh, let me let that run in the background so you can see the results of that while I uh, explain the uh, the next step okay so why I say this whole thing is a bit of a hack is because I'm using the event graph with a bunch of uh, mathematical calculations and whatnot when really you should be using uh, a behavior tree with the AI and uh, that behavior tree should get positions onto a nav mesh using an EQS query <laughs> And that EQS query should be a, a grid of dots onto the nav mesh, which you can sort with conditions, right? So basically, an EQS query would be a grid of points in which you can tell me, okay, uh, give me all of the points in the order to where they are the closest to where I want to go on the spline. And then once you've got them in the right order, only give me the ones I have a direct line of sight to which is going to be casting a, a line trace from your position to every point in the EQS query and if that line trace doesn't hit anything that means you have a, le uh, a clear line of view and you can go to that point without hitting anything and so that's the point you want but you want that closest point to the spline that you can get and that's why you need a, a query of those points right and uh, if it sounds like I just spoke a foreign language uh, it's perfectly fine it's a uh, it's a huge topic to cover behavior trees blackboards nav meshes and pathfinding and EQS queries and all of that stuff is so 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 complicated I still haven't decided how I'm going to make a tutorial on that without making it like 30 episodes, you know. And so, yeah, this whole AI I just showed you is a bit of a hack. But again, you know, people say that because it's not supposedly the, the proper way to do this. I, I think it's kind of a, a snob way to say it. Because there's no really right or wrong way, so long as it works, you know, the player is not going to notice how you did this. The player is only going to see if it works, right? And uh, yeah, to everybody out there saying that this is the wrong way to do it, you're not seeing those people actually teaching you how to do it the right way. So, screw them, right? <laughs> but yeah, I, I just had to say it, this, this is quite a hack. You know, professionals wouldn't do it like that but it works perfectly fine so so yeah alright this is it for this video thanks for watching again stay tuned for the next one where I'm going to use curves to make this AI so overly complicated just for the sake of the AI being able to drive multiple cars and not just that one that you've used to tweak the variables and as always if you like my content feel free to go ahead and subscribe to my Patreon. That helps a lot. Also join the Discord server. And I will see you soon.